I was told I'd be shaved from the top of my hair to the sole of my feet, cleanly shaving my lashes and brows, and my toenails would be clipped and covered with a special material to make them softer, accommodating me into a new life possible on the other side of the portal. Any extremities poking out were dangerous to myself and the mission. It's like being born again, Mr. Rosenberg said. He insisted that we hadn't found the cure for sundry illnesses because we looked at symptoms rather than sources. Children, he said, were key in solving the world's problems with illness and disease, alluding to the biblical Christ. According to him, humans didn't need sex to reproduce. It was the work of an alien civilization populating our species. If not, every sexual encounter would result in a child, he argued. I was indifferent to his argument and let it be. However, Mr. Rosenberg believed humans were too soft, overly protective of children, seeing ourselves in them instead of recognizing the danger they posed. He claimed that children born with hair or nails were impure beings from other realms, bringing diseases with them. Mr. Rosenberg had submitted papers documenting his claims, but ignored, he turned to time travel. The machine was a gray pod with posts on each side, a sliding bar over the door, ensuring only someone outside could open it. This was to prevent aliens, aware of his understanding of time travel through birth, from destroying the machine. Its operation was simple, with just an on and off button, designed so a complex civilization would struggle with it. He applied a foul-smelling material to my nails and guided me into the pod, making me uneasy about the whole ordeal. Despite his madness, Mr. Rosenberg's offer was tempting. He had $500 for anyone willing to travel through time in his pod and return with a testimony, desperate for money. I had planned to concoct a story about a future where houses could disappear on command, leveraging Rosenberg's madness for financial gain. My plan to fabricate a story about a future where people didn't need cars and could teleport anywhere consumed my thoughts as I stepped into the pod. Mr. Rosenberg shut me in, and the machine began to emit an ear-piercing drone that made me dizzy. I covered my ears, trying to block out the noise, but then a strange, overwhelming sensation took over. The air inside the pod changed. It didn't smell like oxygen, but was heavier, making it hard to breathe. Panic set in as I feared suffocating. I had never been claustrophobic, but in those moments, I felt like I was in hell, desperate to escape the pod. The air smelled foul, and as I struggled to breathe, my heart slowed until its beat was barely perceptible. My limbs felt impossibly heavy, and eventually, I slumped over, holding my breath one last time before my eyes closed instinctively. I was vaguely aware of the pod opening. Despite experiencing the machine's dizzying effects, the influx of fresh air revived me somewhat. To make my fabricated testimony more convincing, I stayed still, eyes closed, limbs relaxed. Mr. Rosenberg spoke, and a chill went through me as he revealed his true intentions with a whisper. I hope you taste better than the last one. As he picked me up and placed me on a trolley, my blood froze as I tried to comprehend his words. I had only wanted the $500. Mr. Rosenberg wheeled me into a freezing room, and I continued to feign unconsciousness. The horrifying truth of his words hit me dumped me on the floor next to another cleanly shaved human body, with a portion of its chest removed. The sight and smell of blood made me sick, and I nearly vomited. 
Hearing Mr. Rosenberg's voice and the sound of clanging blades, I was petrified. The rapid beating of my heart was the only warmth in the cold freezer as his gloved hands. As Mr. Rosenberg grabbed my shoulder and turned me over, his eyes turned devilish, black, and utterly evil. He raised the knife poised to end my life for his cannibalistic pleasure. In a panic, I reacted instinctively, attacking his hands and driving the knife towards his face. It missed by inches, but found a more lethal target in his neck. You are not dead, he choked out, blood sputtering from his wound as he collapsed, clutching at the air in agony. I heard his dying cries as I searched for my clothes not pausing for a moment, despite the shock of the ordeal, the thought of nearly being murdered for a mere five hundred dollars haunted me even as I escaped from Mr. Rosenberg's clutches. Later, while working a late shift at the police station, I encountered Adam. It was a Friday night, and I was overseeing the jail cells, filled with those arrested for DUIs, disorderly conduct, and similar offenses. Among the inmates were a familiar woman in a red dress and two men, one a massive bodybuilder, the other a frightened, scrawny individual. As I pondered the dynamics among the detainees, an officer brought in another man, dressed entirely in gray, for rambling nonsensically. Despite a psychological evaluation deeming him of sound mind, he was held for disorderly conduct, but seemed unfazed by his situation. The man in gray, who introduced himself as Adam, wore a long gray tunic and pants, resembling a costume from a Star Wars movie. He was pale, with greasy hair, and struck up a conversation with me, inquiring about my career as a police officer. Adam's demeanor was friendly, and he seemed completely lucid, leaving me curious about his story. Adam explained that his altercation with the old man stemmed from a discussion about his own background, which the man had found unbelievable. Adam was accustomed to skepticism regarding his experiences and the extraordinary people he had encountered. He didn't elaborate on what specifically triggered the old man, but the resulting argument landed Adam in the cell. Despite the altercation, Adam seemed more inconvenienced than perturbed, implying the old man was likely comfortably at home while he was incarcerated. Curiosity piqued. I probed further about Adam's origins, not the incident with the old man, but how he claimed to have arrived here. Adam, with a mixture of resignation and humor, claimed he was from the future, specifically the year 2122, and described himself as a prisoner of war captured by Russians during a protracted 50-year conflict between America and Russia, initiated by a nuclear attack on Los Angeles. Adam's narrative took an even more fantastical turn as he described time travel being used as a form of psychological torture in the future. Prisoners who refused to cooperate were sent back in time to random, often traumatic points in history for short periods. He recounted stories of other time travelers who found themselves in dire historical moments, such as Nagasaki during the atomic bomb drop or in a concentration camp during World War II. According to Adam, these experiences were meant to disorient and break the prisoner's spirits, making them question their own reality to the point of insanity. Adam then posed a series of rhetorical questions, drawing parallels between the disbelief and skepticism faced by purported time travelers and everyday experiences of gaslighting lies, and mistrust that can lead to self-doubt and confusion. 
His analogy suggested that the psychological impact of such skepticism and manipulation could indeed be profound, whether in the context of extraordinary claims like time travel or more mundane personal experiences of betrayal and abuse. Adam's explanation resonated deeply, highlighting the profound impact of disbelief and skepticism on one's mental state. He likened it to an intensified form of anxiety, where the lack of belief from others can lead to a destructive spiral of self-doubt and confusion, akin to being trapped in a mental black hole. His hope was that I would never have to understand that level of discomfort, emphasizing the power of belief and the psychological turmoil that ensues when it's absent. Interrupted by duty, I took a lunch break, promising Adam I'd return for more of his story. However, upon my return, the station was in disarray, and Adam was nowhere to be found. My partner informed me that there was no record of Adam being brought in, suggesting he might have escaped. Despite efforts to issue an APB, all paperwork and information related to Adam had inexplicably vanished. Security footage showed Adam one moment, and then nothing the next, as if he had simply disappeared into thin air. I harbored a theory about what happened to Adam knew it would sound unbelievable to others. This encounter with Adam unfolded amidst my personal grief over the loss of my girlfriend, Alyssa, who had died unexpectedly in a tragic accident. We had been close to building a life together. A dream shattered in an instant. The subsequent period was marked by profound sorrow and loneliness, compounded by a sense of guilt at the thought of moving on. Over time, however, I recognized the necessity of letting go of the grief that had anchored me to the past. Encouraged by a friend, I tentatively ventured back into the dating scene, a decision that felt like a betrayal of Alyssa's memory at first. Yet, in a moment of loneliness, I found myself downloading a dating app ready to explore the possibility of finding love again, despite having met Alyssa in a more traditional setting. This step marked the beginning of a new chapter, one filled with the hope of moving past the pain and embracing the future. Venturing into the world of dating apps for the first time, I reminded myself there was no pressure. Setting up my profile, I went to bed not expecting much. Yet, the next morning, I was startled to see a notification from Hinge. It read, Alyssa liked you, matched to continue the conversation. The name Alyssa struck a chord, stirring a mix of confusion and emotion. Was this a mere coincidence or some cruel twist of fate? Trying to dismiss the unsettling feeling, I went about my morning routine. However, another notification drew me back to my phone, revealing a message from Alyssa on Hinge. This was unusual, as I thought messaging was only possible after matching. Curiosity overcame my apprehension, and I opened the app to find that the profile picture was unmistakably that of my late girlfriend, Alyssa. The photo was unfamiliar, yet her features were unmistakable. Convinced this was a distasteful prank, I responded to the message, demanding the perpetrator to stop. The conversation that ensued only deepened my distress. The person insisted they were Alyssa, claiming, I'm not dead. Overwhelmed and shaken, I closed the app and tried to distance myself from the situation struggling to understand who would orchestrate such a cruel hoax and why they would target me in such a personal and painful manner, refusing to acknowledge my commands. I watched in 
horror as the front door slowly creaked open, revealing a shadowy figure. I tried to scream, but no sound emerged. The figure approached, and I felt an icy touch enveloping me, followed by engulfing darkness. When I awoke the next morning, I was physically exhausted, yet mentally refreshed. The events of that night left me bewildered. The shadow, its touch. It felt like Alyssa, but not in any form I recognized. Despite the terror, there was a peculiar enjoyment in those moments of horror. Was it merely a dream? Or was there something more to Alyssa's presence? In a separate thread of my life, my sister Lucy vanished without a trace three years ago. Her disappearance was sudden and unexplained. She seemed just as usual the night before she left. When she didn't return the next day, our search among her friends yielded no clues. Her room was left almost intact, with only a suitcase and some clothes missing. Despite her being 18, the lack of evidence of any wrongdoing meant the police were of little help. Years passed, and while I thought of Lucy less frequently, her absence remained a void in my life. Then, unexpectedly, I stumbled upon a video on Instagram. It was an ad for Carver Dance Studio, a place I'd never heard of, featuring a video of Lucy. She was older, her hair longer, performing ballet with a haunting, emotionless expression, so different from the vibrant sister I remembered. Driven by a mix of curiosity and desperation, I clicked on the ad, only to find a website filled with videos of different girls dancing in a similar manner against a black backdrop, with no other information available, and my parents still away. I hesitated to involve them or the authorities immediately. Instead, I followed the account and sent a message inquiring about their location, to which I received no reply. The silence and the haunting image of Lucy in that video weighed heavily on me, leaving me torn between hope and dread about what might have happened to her and how it connected to the eerie experiences I had with Alyssa's digital ghost said to make sure I was ready and to not worry too much, assuring me that we'd figure this out together. With Sarah's support, I felt a bit more at ease, but still apprehensive about what we might discover at Carver Studios' so-called audition. The address led us to a dilapidated warehouse on Lark Street, its rundown appearance doing nothing to alleviate my growing sense of dread. The surrounding barbed wire fence only added to the ominous atmosphere. As we approached, I couldn't help but wonder about the legality and safety of this operation. It didn't seem right that a legitimate dance studio would host auditions in such a decrepit setting. Despite my fears, the thought of possibly finding Lucy, or at least getting some answers about her whereabouts, propelled me forward. Sarah and I arrived just before 2 p.m., giving us a chance to scope out the area before the auditions were supposed to start. We saw a few other women arriving, some looking as uncertain as we felt. As the time for the audition neared, we debated our next steps. Should we try to blend in and participate in the audition to gather information? Or should we hang back and observe? The decision was tough, as both options carried their own risks. Ultimately, we decided to maintain a low profile, opting to watch and gather as much information as possible without directly involving ourselves. This approach seemed safer and would allow us to leave quickly if things felt too dangerous. The experience at the warehouse left me with more questions than answers. The atmosphere inside was eerie a strange tension that seemed to hang over the place. The auditions were conducted in a manner that felt off, with 
little regard for the dancer's well-being or comfort. It was clear that this was no ordinary dance studio. After the auditions, Sarah and I left feeling unsettled and with a deeper conviction that something sinister was going on at Carver Studio. The lack of information and the studio's elusive nature only added to our suspicions. We knew we had to take further action. But the question remained, how could we expose the truth behind Carver Studio and ensure the safety of those involved, including Lucy? Explain to the officer the situation as quickly as I could, my voice trembling with urgency. I told him about the suspicious audition, the eerie warehouse, and how my friend Sarah had just disappeared inside. The officer listened intently, his expression growing increasingly concerned as I relayed the details. Without wasting a moment, the officer called for backup and approached the warehouse door his hand resting on the holster of his service weapon. He knocked authoritatively, announcing his presence and demanding that the door be opened. There was a tense silence, the kind that stretches time and amplifies every small sound. Finally, the door creaked open again, this time revealing a man with a hard to place accent, the same one we'd heard before. He appeared confused and slightly annoyed by the presence of the police. The officer started questioning him while I peered inside, desperately searching for any sign of Sarah. The warehouse interior was dimly lit, revealing a large, empty space with a few scattered chairs and a makeshift stage. There was no sign of the other women we'd seen earlier, and more importantly, no sign of Sarah. My heart raced as I considered the possibilities, each more frightening than the last. The police conducted a thorough search of the premises, calling out for Sarah and checking every possible hiding spot. After what felt like an eternity, they found her in a small, locked room towards the back of the warehouse. She was shaken, explaining that the man had suddenly guided her into the room and locked the door, telling her it was part of the audition process. The police took the man into custody, and an investigation into Carver Studio and its operations was launched. Sarah and I were questioned further, and we provided all the information we had, including the Instagram account strange videos of Lucy. The incident at the warehouse was a wake-up call to the dangers lurking behind seemingly innocuous invitations. Sarah's quick thinking to suggest calling the police had potentially saved us from a dire situation. The relief of having her safe, coupled with the ongoing investigation, gave me a glimmer of hope that we might finally uncover the truth about Lucy's disappearance and the real intentions of Carver Studio. Despite my frantic and jumbled explanation, the officer could sense the urgency and panic in my voice as I recounted the events leading to Sarah's disappearance into the warehouse. With his gun at the ready, he approached the door, which, to our surprise, was unlocked. He ventured into the darkness, and for a moment, I feared for his safety as well, worried he might also be ensnared by whatever danger lurked inside. However, he re-emerged shortly after, bearing grim news. The warehouse was completely empty. It's been two days since that harrowing incident, and the police have conducted an exhaustive search of the warehouse and the surrounding area. Yet found no evidence of any occupants or activities. It's as if the warehouse had always stood vacant, a silent sentinel to an unspoken mystery. My attempts to provide leads proved futile as well. The Carver Studio Instagram account had vanished without a trace. The police promised to delve into digital investigations, 
But so far, no new information has surfaced. My parents returned home yesterday. Their presence a small comfort amidst the swirling chaos of worry and despair. Despite their efforts to console me, hope is a fragile thread, steadily fraying with each passing moment. The thought that Sarah might be lost to us, much like Lucy, is a weight too heavy to bear, driven by a mixture of desperation and the slimmest hope. I find myself repeatedly checking Instagram, silently praying for a sign of life from either Sarah or Lucy. Just a glimpse, a single video, could reassure me that they are still out there, somewhere, clinging to life. <laughs>